ladies and gentlemen. We are a few minutes late, but I think we're ready to start now. And we are so delighted to have some gentlemen with us in the audience today. We thank you for coming. We'd like to welcome all of you to the third callers panel that has, has taken place at Caller Lab Conventions. We think we have some different information to give to you today. The theme for our convention this year, as you all know, is attitude and judgment. The attitude and judgment of a caller's partner can sometimes have as much effect on the caller's career as that of the caller himself. If you go into a dance in a happy mood, as the caller's partner, this can uh, rub off on the dancers and start out in a good mood for the evening. On the other hand, if you go in in a bad mood, it sometimes is surprising how many of the ladies particularly will follow your lead. If you enjoy people, let them know it. If you maintain a happy attitude, it's bound to carry over to all of the dancers. And if you and your caller can go in as a happy team, this can help make the evening, can get it off to a very special start and hopefully carry through for the whole evening. A caller's partner is often in a position where her judgment, good or bad, can have an effect not only on the caller and his partner, but on the club and the dancers. We have an excellent panel for you today. Hopefully they are going to give you some information that will help you make a choice between good and bad judgment if something arises that, that you need to worry about. Ruthie Custer and her caller husband, Ruthie is in the green, for those of you that don't know her. They're from Hagerstown, Maryland. They began square dancing in 1956, and Curly started his calling career in 1957. He currently calls for six, six clubs and teaches a beginner's class each year. Ruthie attends most club dances with Curly and travels with him when he calls out of town. She is an excellent seamstress, makes many of their square dance outfit, outfits and also most of her street clothes. She does most any kind of handwork, and she and Curly are the parents of two daughters and two granddaughters, of whom they are very, very proud. Curly is presently a member of the Board of Governors, and I'm sure most of you saw the interesting article about Curly and his father in the January Square Dancing magazine about the airplanes. Ruthie is going to give you some pointers today on public relations, and she certainly has had years of experience to go behind her presentation. Our other female panelist is Carol Manning. She and her husband Dick started dancing 20 years ago, and after only five lessons, Dick decided calling was what he wanted to do. Does that sound familiar to lots of us? The Mannings called and taught several classes in New Mexico, Utah, and Alaska before settling in Oklahoma City in 1972. They have both written several articles which have appeared in both Square, American Squares and Square Dancing magazines. They especially enjoy working with new callers and spend as much time as possible in this effort. The Mannings have two sons and a daughter, all of whom are square dancers. Carol has an interesting presentation for you today on how to build confidence if you are one of the many callers partners who are in that position whether you are willing to be there or not. And I think many of us find we're put there without really wanting to do it. I know you enjoy your suggestions and again there are handouts on the table in back. Are they still there? We'll check and make sure. Many of you in the last two years have expressed a need for help in the proper use of a microphone. We as callers partners are often put in the position of using a microphone for announcements and it's so much easier if we're sure we are using the microphone properly so people can hear us well. Kip Garvey volunteered 
quote unquote, <clears throat> to come and give us some pointers on this subject. Kip is now living in California. He moved there very recently from Massachusetts. He's been calling for 20 years, although he doesn't look old enough to have been calling for 10. And he is a full-time professional caller, as I'm sure all of you know. He is also an accredited caller coach, accredited through Caller Lab. We thank you very much, Kip, for taking time for, from your busy schedule to come and help us, because this is an area I think many of us need much help in. He's going to start our presentations today as he has to leave as soon as he's through to go to another commitment, probably at the other end of the hotel. That's, that's the way it usually works. So I would like to introduce to you Kip Garvey, and let's give him a good partner's welcome. Hi, everybody. How's your attitude? <laughs> Coming along, isn't it? Uh, I have to start my stopwatch because I'm on a definite schedule here. Actually, I begged Erna to let me come in and speak to you people. Uh, she turned it around a little bit, and I asked her if I could have an hour and a half, and she said the best I can do is ten minutes, Kip. So, at any rate, it is my pleasure to, to have the opportunity to address the unsung heroes of the squid ants industry, and that's the call as partners. And I know that there are many, many concerns that the partners have. Um, I'm here basically to discuss one of them with you. Carol is here to discuss one of them with you, and Ruthie too. Carol's presentation dovetails just a little bit into mine, or mine will dovetail a little bit into her presentation, basically because the use of a microphone uh, and the use of sound equipment is really a case of self-confidence. Self-confidence based on the knowledge that if you do stand up behind the microphone, you do begin to touch some electronic equipment that it won't blow up or the speakers won't fall down or, or you won't say something which might be detrimental either to your club or some personal relationships you have in the club or something of this nature. There's a lot that goes through an individual's mind when he steps up to a microphone to make any kind of a, a presentation. But basically, uh, I can remember so well when uh, Kathy and I first had the opportunity to do the Washington Spring Festival uh, in Washington, D.C., and on Saturday night they make a presentation of all the college partners and bring them up on stage. It's a very high stage, 10 feet off the ground, off the floor, there are roughly 450 squares out there, and of course every head is, is turned in your direction. Now if you'd like, you can multiply 450 times 8, and that's how many people were there. Then multiply it by 2, and that's how many eyes are on you. And uh, I guarantee you see every single one, every eyeball, clean on down the back of the hall. And when Kathy was introduced, she stood up on the stage, and in her own elegant way, because she is an elegant person, she waved to the group. And I saw it. I actually saw it happen. Just like you could walk up with, a, with your fingernail and click her in the back of the head and she would shatter, just like a piece of plate glass. Because she froze, absolutely froze right there, with that big smile on her face and the hand going, and just froze from, from nothing more than the fact that there she was with all those eyes staring back at her. And, of course, this is just one of the many aspects of getting behind a microphone and addressing a group of people. Uh, we callers take it for, we really do take it quite for advantage because we do it all the time. And it's nothing for us to say, honey, will you please go up to the stage, pick up the microphone, and tell the people that tomorrow night's dance or, or next week's dance is we're going dark. I forgot to make the announcement. For him, it's a very normal, or for her, it's a very normal thing to do to go up to the stage, pick up the microphone. But for the person who has to actually do it now, a crisis has occurred, and they have to say, well, yes, or no, no, I can't, I can't do it. Uh, you do it. And this is what we're here to discuss right now. Basically, the first aspect of picking up a microphone and addressing a group of people is one of self-confidence. The fact that when you do this, people are more interested in what you say than not what you look like or not how you hold your microphone, or anything of this nature. 
And you have a tremendous advantage being a callous partner in that you really don't have to make a lecture. Most of the time, if you use a microphone, it's for a short announcement or it's for a clarification of procedures within the club or some sort of a calling schedule. So there's, there's really no big deal. No one's asking you to do a singing call. Nobody is asking you to get up and recite the Gettysburg Address. Uh, so we have to more or less have a laid-back attitude on this. When you grab a hold of a microphone for the first time and you're addressing a group of people, think only of what it is that you have to say. Don't think about the people looking back at you. Forget about them. You're there to give a message, and the message that you want to give is. We've had a change in our refreshment schedule for next week. Will all those people who are on next week's refreshment schedule please meet me in the back of the hall? simple as that. So if you can get the message across, then we come to the next critical aspect of, of using microphones, and that's actually picking this piece of metal up in our hands and looking down and watching the wire, and the wire leads into that thing on the floor or on the table, which has all these things on them, and you watch your partner as he's calling, and every once in a while he'll do this, and he makes adjustments here and there, and the concern suddenly hits you. What if I do something to mess up this $2,000 piece of equipment? What? <laughs> and it's a flash. It happens in, in just an instant. That one moment of fear where all of a sudden you're unsure of yourself. It's a matter of self-confidence. That's all. So what we will do is we will let you know that a microphone is nothing to fear. It, it is simply a device by which we take our voice. The voice goes through the cable into the set, is amplified, comes out the speaker, so that everybody will hear us and not just the first few people. That's all. That's all a microphone does. It helps us to communicate. So when you pick up the microphone, please know this in your own mind, that what you're really doing is you're addressing these people just as if they were standing next to you. Unfortunately, they're not, so you have to talk through the microphone. And that's all there is to it. You're... <coughs> Excuse me. Your caller's partner, that is the calling aspect of the caller's partner, is the, the man who is the expert or the gal who is the expert with the equipment. And if that person is, is asking you to go up and make an announcement, certainly he must be sure or she must be sure that the equipment is ready for you to make an announcement. Uh, most callers will do this when the club president gets up to make his announcement. We stand very close to that turntable and make the uh, necessary adjustments to that person's voice because some of the club presidents that we have, be they male or female, are in the same boat that you are in. They have absolutely no idea of what it's like to get up with a microphone in their hand. I've seen men, giants, six foot two, 240 pounds and yet 34 inch waists, men with voices that would knock you down, get up behind that microphone and break into a clear falsetto. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please. And this is the type of thing that we're talking about. It's that self-confidence. And it is not a thing that is lacking in women. It is not a thing that is lacking in men. It is a thing that is lacking in most individuals who are put into a situation that they are totally unfamiliar with. You can become accustomed to the use of sound equipment. There is no problem in becoming accustomed to the use of sound equipment. If you are in the position where you are home all day while your calling partner is out at work, chances are the equipment is in the house. And without him or her even knowing it, you could sneak into his private office. Ah, is he kidding? That sacred sanctatorium where he hides himself during all his free hours and grab that piece of equipment and throw the cover off and just take a look at it and see what it's all about. That's what we'll do right this very minute. Mm -hmm. This remarkable piece of equipment is generally considered to be the Cadillac of the transcription amplifier players that we have in the industry. It's made by Jim Hilton. A lot of men use it. 
Uh, some men prefer other types of units. But the basic idea behind the controls on this unit are universal. That is, they, you will find the same identical controls on any type of a transcription amplifier type player. Now, this particular set is very, very attractive. It's physically attractive. So this immediately sets you off. You don't want to touch it. That's the first reaction you see with, with people who get on the stage and they, they can touch this. But that, my God, look at it. It sparkles. <laughs> what happens if I touch it? So there, it's nothing, folks. All it is is press board, you know, with a, with, with a real fancy canvas cover. And this is sheet metal right here, aluminum, iodized aluminum. And these plates right here are nice pearly type, uh, mother of pearl type plastic plates. I and mean, that's all it is. These are black knobs. They're made of plastic. And you turn them, see, and it goes like this, and nothing happens. All right? It's as simple as that. Now, now... This, this device right here is the tone arm, and it generally goes on the record, and that's how the music is played. <laughs> I'm going to take this off. This is a piece of protection. It's, it's styrofoam. What it does is it keeps the tone arm in place so that in transit the tone arm won't flop around. If you want to use the tone arm, please make sure this is off. There. Are you taking notes? There will be a written exam after this, you all know. <laughs> yes, that's right. I'm going to swing the set around for you folks over here in just one second. All right? Now, the tone arm is something you really don't have to worry about, so that's it on the tone arm. Got it? This is the turntable itself. This goes around, generally. What's locking it? Something's locking it. Okay. He has some protective packaging under that, too, and that's not going to go around for me. All right, but basically that will go around. And, you know, this, this knob over here, excuse me, you folks can probably get a pretty good visualization of this without seeing it, right? I hope so. <laughs> but this, this over here says phonograph, okay? And that's, that big knob, if you turn that, that means the volume when the music goes up. If you turn it this way and the volume goes down. Over here it says monitor. Nine times out of ten, we don't even use it, all right? Some of the men like to use monitors, and they'll use the monitor circuit. Some men who like to use monitors use the regular circuit that they're using, and it's plugged into other channels, and they're not even using the monitor circuit. So forget about the monitor. Just don't worry about it. There's nothing that you will ever have to do to concern yourself with the monitor, hopefully, except the one case, which I'll tell you about in just one second. And over here it says microphones. This is your part of the equipment over here, microphones, because you're standing up to make a speech. You don't particularly care about the music. If there's music playing and it, it bothers you, lift the needle off. That's all. Just set it aside. Over here we have microphones. Now, there are two black knobs for the microphones. That's because we have the ability of putting two microphones into this one unit so that two men can work together or a round dance cue and a caller can work together. We have two separate microphone channels. So probably one of the first things you want to do in a glance is to make sure that the microphone you're using is plugged into one of these holes. Because if it's not plugged into the hole, you're not going to come out through the speakers. Then you make sure that you know which one of those two holes the microphone is plugged into. Now this is important because I've seen people up there and they take the on-off switch on the microphone and they throw it. Next thing you know, they're holding two pieces of equipment in their hand. An on-off switch in their left hand and a microphone in their right. And the purpose, the purpose of mentioning this is because they forgot to concern themselves with the fact that the microphone wasn't even plugged in. If the microphone's not plugged in, you're not coming across. Now, there's something else that will interfere with your broadcast, and that is the fact that the microphone is not turned on at the machine. And we do that by turning one of these black knobs. And when the knob is in the proper position, our voice comes out nice and clear. We can also turn the microphone on at the microphone itself, and the microphone will have a switch on it. It'll be a two-position switch. In some cases, it'll say on the microphone, on and off. And a lot of the microphones we use, it is nothing more than a toggle switch located at the base of the grip. And it, generally speaking, in the up position, it is on, and in the down position, it is off. But it's real simple to find out 
which one it is. If you make sure your microphone is plugged in, you make sure you have some volume, you talk into the microphone and nothing comes out, the microphone is off. You throw the switch and the microphone is on. But there is nothing to panic about uh, or to turn to somebody and say, show me how this thing goes, quick. Because then you have to stand there while he goes... <laughs> All right? And that can be a little embarrassing, I would assume. So that is the equipment. And really now, there's not much else you have to know about this piece of equipment. And I do suggest, with or without your partner's permission, because it's no big deal, that either you ask him to show you how to operate his piece of equipment or that you just go in and most of the fellows, I do believe, have a set going all the time in the office, that you simply pick up the microphone and talk into it and get used to the next phenomenon which creates fear in the hearts of, of neophyte speakers, and that's the sound of one's own voice. Amplified and reverberated through the speaker system. Is that me? Wow. Hey, you've heard this before. How many of you have had the experience of taping your own voice and listening to the playback? My God, is that me? There it is. And the same type of phenomenon occurs when you pick up a microphone and you say, Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, and you turn and begin to make adjustments. What you hear in your head when you speak is usually very, very different from what other people hear when you speak. And when you speak into a microphone, there are some adjustments on the machine that you can make to make your voice a little more pleasant if you want. But generally speaking, you will be shocked the first time your voice comes out of a speaker. Okay? Now, some of us have absolutely no problem doing this type of thing. Even if we've never done it before, we simply step up, take the microphone, and make our speech and our announcement and sit down. You see, there's no big deal. Well, for you, it is no big deal. But for the people who have never done this before, and, and, ha and I've seen caller partners say this, you won't catch me up there. I'm not going to get up there. No, he has to make the announcements. For that individual, this might help. This whole experience might help because there is nothing, nothing at all, to getting up and addressing a group of people and making an announcement. It's a matter of attitude, isn't it, and self-confidence. Now, there is a phenomenon that occurs with the use of sound equipment called feedback. And when we adjust our sound systems, a caller, we have adjusted the tone of the voice and the volume of the voice to suit the placement of our speakers in the hall we are in for that dance that evening. Now, I just said a whole lot, and you don't have to worry about that. Okay? That is the, the job and the responsibility of the professional caller to be his own sound engineer, as it were, and to make sure that his sound is balanced. However, the sound is balanced for him or for her. And when somebody else steps up to the machine to make an announcement, generally speaking, it calls for a rebalancing. And at caller schools that we do, we try to explain to the callers, if anybody is going to make an announcement or use your equipment after you've balanced it, stand by the machine yourself Make all the adjustments yourself. Be that person's sound engineer. And it can, it, it can help. In the part of the, in the role that you play as a caller's partner, making a, an interim announcement every once in a while, you can... Good, she's sitting down. <laughs> thought she was after the shepherd's crook. Uh, you can, every once in a while... Uh, when you make your announcements, you can get up there and make your own adjustments. If you're familiar with the machine, just make sure that you adjust it back down again. And this is a, a communication process between you and your caller partner who does the calling and who set up the sound for him or herself. So make sure that you discuss this thing. If you like to do this yourself, if you like to have a different sound come out of those speakers for you, discuss it with him or her so that you can understand each other and, and he doesn't go up there the next minute and throw down a singing call that is supposed to be his for the evening and all of a sudden start coming out like because the, you know, the, ta the tone has been changed or the volume. Now we come to this aspect called feedback. Feedback is an electronic phenomenon uh, basically uh, 
all of all of the sound that comes out comes out in sound waves and there's a possibility under certain conditions that these sound waves can be fed back into is that you Herb, doing that <laughs> no <laughs> somebody's giving me a live demonstration of feedback here can be fed back into the microphone and reamplified, and this occurs at an accelerating pace so that all the sounds that we distinguish as speech come out as a high pitched noise. And let's see if I can try it this way. One, two, one, two. Oh, no. I don't even know where the speakers are in here. But at any rate, this can happen basically if you do cover the microphone and you have open face speakers coming out from behind you. Uh, what happens is you're capturing the sound. The sound is actually ricocheting through your palms, back directing it into the head of the microphone, being reamplified and coming out as a screech. Now, we, we've all experienced this, right? This happens particularly if somebody steps in front of a, of a speaker with a live microphone. Uh, callers do it. I do it myself more often than I like. But every once in a while, I might be working with a man on the stage. I have a yak stack column on here on the table. And, uh, and I'll say, you take the next one. In the process of doing that, I'm holding the microphone over near the speaker, and the next thing the dancer hears is a big screech. So this is feedback. Now, for a lady especially who is picking up a man's balance on, on a set, she will have a tendency to talk into the microphone, and we'll talk about distance in a minute, but she will speak towards the microphone, and she won't hear enough of herself so she'll reach down and she'll turn the knob, just like Kip Garvey told the two down there in Miami, Florida. She'll turn the knob and screech. Okay, you can turn the knob too high, you see. And what you do is, for broadcasting purposes, you find out just about where it's going to feed back. You can begin to hear the echo and the reverberation, then back it off. Then, then back it off. And if it, your voice is still too light, move up on the head of the microphone. And you do not have to screech into a microphone to be heard, you can practically whisper and still be heard. And as a matter of fact, when you're making announcements, it's a very good technique. If the floor is noisy, what do you do? Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very important announcement to make. For those of you, for those of you who are intending on going to this particular function, shh, what'd you say, what'd you say, what'd you say? Then you can pick it up. Yes, I said, uh, for those of you who are planning to go to the function next weekend, that type of thing, see? So when you work with a microphone, bear all this in mind. But again, get rid of, of this uh, uh, fear that you might have that something is going to go wrong with the equipment or that you might break something or that somebody might be staring at you, which is ridiculous. I mean, I'm standing here speaking to you, and I'm worried about people who aren't looking at me. <laughs> especially the ones with their eyes closed. <laughs> However, you can expect when you make an announcement that people will direct their attention to you. It's very, very normal for that, for that to occur, and don't let that shake you. Uh, get yourself used to the equipment. Uh, pick up a microphone, hold it in your hand, and find out exactly how to speak into the head of a microphone. Different microphones have what we call different pickup patterns, different patterns that pick up your voice. Some of them are... are Per protected to the front so that s sounds coming back towards you will not get into the head of the microphone. Uh, some of them pick up from all sides, all around, up, up and down, the so-called omnidirectional head. And that is the type of microphone which will feed back on you very, very quickly if you have what we call center point sound, sound behind you coming from a central point across the hall. So make sure that, that you can play with a microphone. Most of your calling uh, partners will have a particular type of microphone. I don't see any big deal in having, uh, you know, my partner pick up the microphone and play with the equipment a little bit and uh, maybe even try a little calling as long as she doesn't get too good. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we hope this has been helpful in some way. Thank you, Erna. Thank you very much, Kip. Do you have a few minutes if some of the ladies have questions that you could answer? Could we impose on you for a few minutes longer? Or do you need to run? Any questions at all that before Kip has to go that he maybe could answer for you? No. Distance from the mic. You said we would get to. 
you did it. <laughs> okay. Okay, distance from the mic is, a, is really a product of, of many different things. It's a product of how, how the sound speakers are placed against the balance in the set, against the type of microphone you're using, and against the power of your own voice. When you... <coughs> I wish I had a microphone here I could demonstrate with, but I, I just fell short on that. But when you do have a microphone, there are a, a number of methods to use. One thing you do not want to do is to rest the microphone on your chin, directly against your skin. All right, now, we have... A lot of callers today who feel that this is a very, very appropriate method, but uh, again, in the uh, just just for general principles, uh, for public speaking, we do not want anything to interfere with our lower jaw, which might affect our diction, which therefore would affect the message that we're bringing across. So, therefore, it, it is not necessary to rest the microphone head against the lower chin to make your speech. To hold the microphone approximately one and a half to two inches from your mouth and directly below your lower lip so that in a straight line projecting from your face so that the sound as you speak is traveling over the head of the microphone and the head is allowed to pick up the fullness and richness of all the tones that are coming out of your mouth. Uh, you can hold the microphone too far down. And, and your posture will have a lot to do with this. If you are a very erect person, you will have a tendency to hold the microphone down. Uh, again, we see this on public announcements with our news broadcasters who have the long stem microphones and they hold them down here. Well, that has, happens to be a very controlled situation and the sound that you hear on your TV is being produced in a sound studio and does not necessarily mean that that man is holding the, the microphone correct. That is a good, correct posture for a TV announcer but not necessarily for what we want to do because our microphones do not pick up that far of a distance from our mouths. So you'll find that with the use of our microphones, a good two inches from the mouth and just below it, and maybe slightly angled towards the mouth without pointing straight into your head, but slightly angled towards the mouth would be the best posture for the microphone itself. And of course, with yourself standing as erect as you can for, for your own personal diction and breathing, uh, to eliminate some of the nerve problems that, that you might have as you're speaking. Okay? Do we have any other questions? Okay. Again, we thank you, Kip. For the rest of our uh, time before the coffee break, Ruth and Carol both will make their presentations and in between we will have possibly a few minutes for questions. After the coffee break we do have the room for another hour and a half. If there is anything uh, you'd like to discuss that we have not hit on in the presentations or if you have more questions for either of the panelists or for me, we'd be happy to come back in at 3.30 and stay till 5 o'clock if there's that much interest. Our first, uh, our next presentation will be Ruthie Custer, and we thank her very much for coming to be with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Kip, for that interesting talk on microphone usage. I'm sure that we will all benefit from your talk, both the, the, those who are experienced and inexperienced at using the microphone. As Ernest said, I'm the wife of Curly Custer, and I, Curly has never enjoyed traveling alone, so I have always tried to travel to the dances with him. When I, we began dancing, our girls were 7 and 11 years of age, and Grandma was always willing to babysit for us, so I therefore was able to travel to the dances with Curly. Curly and I have always enjoyed traveling together. The countryside is so beautiful, and there is so much to be seen between cities in all parts of the country. The, the beautiful scenery throughout the country, especially in the spring and fall, makes us feel very humble, and we are great, very grateful for each day of life. Curly and I like to use the adage, live, love, learn in our daily living. 
We feel that each new day of life is truly a gift of each new day is truly a gift of life. And that to live is to love and to love is to learn. We try to live each day to its fullest and we especially appreciate the beauty that is to be found everywhere. I have always enjoyed the role of the caller's partner. I enjoy not only the dances, but I also enjoy being able to share my square dancing enthusiasm with the dancers. As a caller's partner, I try to be tactful in the remarks I make to others, always remembering that if you cannot say something good, do not say anything at all. Curly and I also strive to treat others as we ourselves like to be treated. Good public relations with club members, club officers, guests, and other callers is a vital part in, in promoting harmony in the square dance activity. The term public relations is a difficult one to define. In essence, good public relations have been created when customers and clients are satisfied with a product or service. Good public relations should, should show concern not only for customers but for all people everywhere. Therefore, as caller, caller's partners, we should endeavor to create good public relations at all times so that we may sell and promote our product or our service which just happens to be the caller to whom we are married. There are many pluses in being the partner of a traveling caller. However, there are also some minuses. It is fun to travel to new and previously traveled areas, and it is also always great to visit with friends in those previously traveled areas. All right. Um, it is also great also rewarding to continue to make new friends in the newer areas. However, along with some of the beautiful trips which we like to remember, there are also times when the traveling experience in getting to a dance can be one that we would rather forget. We have traveled in all kinds of weather, sunshine, moonlight, rain, sleet, snow, ice, wind, and hail and we have even been on the fringe of some small tornadoes and floods. Many times the experience in getting to a dance can be hectic and frustrating and just too close for comfort. Even though a trip has been carefully planned and adequate traveling time has been allowed, sometimes un unforeseen things will occur, such as traffic tie-ups on the interstates and un unforeseen weather conditions. Sometimes those unforeseen conditions allow us to arrive at the dance just in the nick of time, and we are always thankful when we have arrived without a delay. However, regardless of conditions which have preceded the beginning of the dance, the caller and the caller's partner are expected to arrive at the dance smiling and ready to fulfill the job of giving the scheduled group the best that is possible. Again, good public relations do not let frustration show. Also, the caller and the caller partner must always keep in mind that all groups expect the caller to arrive at their dance in a cheerful and an alert manner. You may have been obliged to party with a group the night before, but today's group doesn't give a hoot about what you did last night. They want you fresh, alert, and cheerful for their dance. Therefore, the caller and the and partner must give of themselves to one group while still saving stamina and enthusiasm for another group. Arriving at a dance tired and disgruntled will promote poor public relations rather than the good public relations for which we all should strive. We recently had an automobile breakdown and our car had to be towed into a garage. Even though this is one experience which we would rather forget, we were grateful for a number of things. Number one, this occurred on our way home from a dance rather than on our way to a dance. Number two, the breakdown occurred 
eight miles from the garage where the car had been purchased. We were near home rather than halfway between locations on some of our longer trips. The night was a clear cold one, but it was without sleet, snow, rain, or extreme wind conditions. For this we were extremely thankful since the police did not show up for one hour and we were cold when they arrived. Even in the worst of circumstances, there is always something for which to be grateful. Even so, these are the times when you feel that life is like an onion. You peel off one layer at a time and sometimes you want to weep. <laughs> As a caller's partner, I try to individualize each dancer by making him or her feel welcome at every dance. We all need to be loved and wanted, and we all need, need to feel that we belong. Being made to feel welcome is a great morale builder, and it is a source of great satisfaction, not only in our daily living, but in our square dance activity. I attempt to learn each dancer by name whenever possible. Every person considers his name very important, and a person is pleased when he or she is recognized and called by name. There is no sweeter word to most people than the correct spelling and the correct pronunciation of one's own name. I also try to show a genuine and personal interest in each dancer by remembering some interesting point of conversation pertaining to family or other interests that the dancer may have. Most of us feel that we want to be part of a group, and it is important for us to feel that we have friends. The square dance activity plays a vital part in our being able to be with those friends whom we love and admire. However, it is wise to remember that to have a friend, you must be a friend. Also, I try to be aware of those loner couples who do not mix well, and of those couples who may need to be introduced to others, always remembering that strangers are friends whom you have not yet met. As a caller's partner, I usually check the sound at the dances, both voice and music from all places in the hall. Curly and I have signals for both voice and music because some hard to sound halls may need a different balance than halls with good acoustics. Also, I act as a sounding board between the dancers and my caller, and I quietly refer any comments to Curly so he may weigh each situation. Good caller attitude and judgment in all situations promote good public relations. As the wife of a caller, I have also occasionally acted above and beyond the call of duty by lending my petty pants to a dancer who may have forgotten her petty pants that evening. I suppose this could also be called good public relations as long as I do not dance without my petty pants. <laughs> the only time that I can really say that I do not enjoy being a caller's partner is when Curly has a cold or a sore throat. And I know that he should not be calling or abusing his throat. When there is a job to be done, but there is not enough voice to do it with, these times are always frustrating to me. It seems as though callers should not get colds, but they are only human. Tolerance and consideration of these conditions on the part of the dancer make for good re public relations from the dancer's standpoint. <clears throat> Throughout our daily living, Curly and I try not to let things upset us. We try to remember that for every minute we are angry, we have lost 60 seconds of happiness. Another adage which we like to remember is, worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it will not get you anywhere. Curly and I also try to learn something new each day. We resolve to work at developing a good attitude both towards ourselves and toward others, reminding ourselves that we can accomplish anything that we set out to do if our minds are open and fertile. The square dance activity lends itself to much new learning, 
and much stimulating of the mind. We realize that we are not born worthwhile, but we are born with the possibility of being worthwhile. And we use this thought daily to improve our learning and knowledge. <clears throat> Therefore, as callers partners, while we are enjoying the many aspects of the square dance activity, we also have a job to do. This job is to sell and promote the caller from Ann Lander's column. The author of this definition is Harry Emerson Fosdick. I would like to read this to you. To laugh often and much, to win respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a better place whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you lived. This is to have succeeded. As Bourne was giving his excellent talk like last night, I could not help but think just how closely this clipping related to his talk. In closing my talk on public relations, I would like to leave one thought with you. Be kind to your friends. If it were not for them, you would be a total stranger. Thank you, Ruthie. Very, very well said. Do any of you have questions for Ruthie? Anything? Yes, in the back. Could you all hear the question? Uh, there is a microphone in the center. Uh, her <laughs> Would you please see what we learned from Kip? What do you do if you have a couple that follows you everywhere you go to the point that even when you go out to eat after the day and they must completely engulf the conversation and then uh, it makes it hard to communicate with other people without being rude to them. Who am I? Rude. You have a problem. <laughs> this just went on to the point where the dancers make remarks about it too, and I don't know how to handle it without being rude to them. I think the best way I can answer that situation is that sometimes you really have to divorce yourself from certain people if, if they are really trying to monopolize your life. And it's hard to do, but situations do arise that you sometimes have to do things that you really don't want to. <laughs> how do you how do you Carol would like to give you an idea too and if she doesn't cover what I'm thinking of then I'll add to it we all have ideas what I had in mind was if the friends are this close and they follow you around like I, I really suggest that you sit down and talk with them and tell them that you are in a position where you are going to have to devote some time to some of the other dancers and explain to them that you enjoy their company but that you really are going to have to spend some time with other people and uh, that perhaps they could help you and put them on the spot make them be the ones who are responsible for seeing to it that you get around to the other people this was very much what I was thinking too does that answer it for you? Let us know if it works, okay? Any other questions? If not, we'll move on in our program to Carol Manning. Before I forget it, uh, Ruthie's comment on names being important really hit home for me. 
I did not introduce myself when we started. I'm Erna Egender, and the name is spelled E-R-N-A, which is an unusual name. I answer to Edna or Ima or Irma, most anything. And even in at the National Convention in Anaheim, I had answered to all of those names, and then I was introduced as Jean. <laughs> and that one really threw me. Thank you. I, first of all, I want to say that it's really an honor to be here to talk with you today, and I have certainly enjoyed working with Erna. Again, she's always so easy to work with on something like this because she's always behind you 100% and can give you guidance and help anytime you need it. So she's super. If you ever have the opportunity to work with Erna, be sure and, and take the, the opportunity and do it. And this is my first time to uh, even meet Ruthie, and it's been an enjoyable experience. And uh, I enjoyed Kip's talk, although he, I think he might have thought he was going to step into a little bit of what I wanted to talk to you about. But really, I, I don't think he did. Uh, what I have become aware of is that there are ladies, uh, there are callers, partners, you have to forgive me with this because I'm, I'm in an area where we, we only have one lady caller and we give her, her spouse or her partner, we really give him the raspberries, you know, when he comes out to the callers meeting. So forgive me if I slip and say uh, woman or wife or spouse. I'll try and keep it to partner. Nevertheless, we found that in talking with some of the gals at some of our little get-togethers that we've had where the guys are off in one corner and all the gals are off in the other corner, that there's been some comments that have come out of this that I have not been aware of until just recently. Maybe I've just had my eyes closed and I wasn't looking in that direction. Nevertheless, it came to mind that some of the gals really do not feel comfortable being a caller's partner. Now, when you're out in the business world and you're going out to hire in for a new job, your qualifications and your training are very important, and they play an important po point in whether you get that job, whether that vacancy is filled by you. Now, unfortunately, when we got the job of a caller's partner, we didn't even fill out an application for the job. I mean, we really, we didn't have the opportunity to say, I really want to be a caller's partner. So we slipped, stepped into the job not really having any particular qualifications to be a caller's partner, not having any training in the field of a caller's partner, because until he becomes a caller, there's no way you can gain this unless it's, you know, one of these other type situations, and I don't want to get into anything like that. But you don't have the opportunity to really get any training into the, into the job. So there are a lot of gals who experience difficulty in, in handling situations that you're thrown into as a caller's partner. Now, when you are expected to smile and show the pearlies and and really put on the, the show and everything, the demands are never ending. It never stops for a caller's partner. And this is where we run into some difficulties in, in our attitude and our judgment. There are times when you just feel like, well, I just can't smile one more time. My face is going to crack. So... It does play a part on your attitude, and, and that in turn, if you, if you get down in the dumps, that's going to have an effect on your judgment. Now, when you run into the, the, when you're put into this position, nobody has taken into consideration that there are different personalities, and that we're all individualists, and that there are different personalities. Now, there's a degree of difficulty experienced here when we get into dealing with personalities. Now, many people are the type who will thrive on attention. 
and they love to be around people. They enjoy talking, they enjoy a crowd, and they enjoy the limelight. Now still there are others who have a hard time in the limelight. They have a hard time conversing with people and yet they are callers, partners, and it is expected of them. So, in these little get-togethers that we've, that we've been into, I've heard the comment said, I can't get that involved. I just, I'm not outgoing. I can't do it. And at first, I really thought it was a cop-out because I thought, surely, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything. And it didn't really come to, come to home, really, until my partner, the caller, said to me after I made a comment, well, that's a cop-out. Listen to that. She could do that if she wanted to. She could handle that fashion show if she wanted to. She could get up there and give all that spiel out. She just doesn't want to do it. When Dick said to me, now wait a minute, maybe she really can't do it. I sat back and took a look and looked back to when Dick first started calling. He was a very withdrawn individual, and anybody that knows Dick now, it's hard to believe. But he did not like crowds. He liked a one-on-one -on -one relationship with someone. And for him to pick up a microphone and speak into it was just nearly impossible. So he came a long way with his, and it brought home to me the idea that there really are people who have a problem communicating with more than one person at a time, that have a problem getting up in front of a crowd, and we need to look into this because we are brought into this position of a caller's partner and we really need, some of us need help in it. So on with this thing here. Uh, the theory that brought, is brought to mind when you're thrown into this is the old theory about learning how to swim. Now some people believe that they can take you out and throw you in the lake and you'll swim or else. But I don't subscribe to that theory. I believe that the best way to learn how to swim is to start in the shallow water. Work slowly. Don't get in over your head. And this works in square dancing. If you're having trouble communicating, if you're having trouble being around more than one person at a time or getting up on a microphone or something like this. Work slowly, but work at it. I know that none of us will ever be like Mark Spitz, but at least if we work at it, we won't drown. I think the best area for a caller spouse to work at building confidence is in your beginner's class. When you're dealing with people who are not really wise to the ways of square dancing, you've really got a slight edge. You've really got an audience that doesn't know any better. They don't know that, that you're not comfortable behind that mic. And they don't know anything about you. They know that you are the instructor's partner. They will look to you for guidance, and you need to be able to provide it for them. Now, what I brought today are some examples of some things that, that I present at our beginner's class. Now, what I want you to think about, and they're in the handouts, and they've moved them over to that red table over there. What I want you to think about is whether you are this type of person or not, it doesn't make any difference. If you have trouble, take what you can of this presentation and use it. If you can't use it, maybe you know someone that can. So I'll show you what, what I do at our beginner's classes, and if you can use some of it, great. 
If you know someone that can use some of it, that's great too. But let me show you what I do. First of all, we feel very important that the beginner dancer is well informed. We like the beginner dancer to know what we expect of them. So we have formulated over the years a little preliminary information for beginner type pamphlet. And we pass this out during the first part of our caller's class, I mean our beginner's class. We pass this preliminary information out. That tells the dancer or the future dancer what is expected of him at the class. That tells him what he will receive from the class. So you sort of clear the air with them. Now, one note of caution on this. When you pass this information out, be sure that you read the information before you give it to the dancers because they will come up with questions that are off the wall. And if you don't know your material, don't, don't give it out until you've read it. Now, we give it out every year, and I have to reread it every year. So be sure that you read the material that you give to the beginners. But take it upon yourself. Your husband does not have the time to teach the figures and the mechanics of square dancing to the, to the beginning student and handle all of this other too and do it with ease and comfort and an enjoyment. You can do part of this. This can be your little, your little con contribution to the square dance world. So take it upon yourself to help in this way Present the material to the beginner dancer. Now, if you don't feel comfortable at getting up at the mic and reading the information to them, don't do it. You can pass it out. You don't have to start out right, right away up on the mic. You can pass it out. You can answer questions on a one-to-one -one basis. But work eventually to where you can feel comfortable with it and you can talk on the mic and explain to more than one person and save a little time. Now... After this, we generally try to pass out the square dancing handbooks so that they're familiar with the figures and they'll have a chance to look these over. I like to be familiar with the figures in case that Dick is too busy with this little group over here trying to help this couple that's having a little trouble and trying to give them a little extra help that I can answer a question or explain something to this group over here that's been zipping right through this thing and they're already into the second handbook. But... I like to be able to intelligently talk to these people about the figures and about the information that we pass out. We encourage all of our class members to subscribe to at least one of the national magazines because the better informed your students are, the better dancers they will be. Now, as we move into the class, I arrange for two fashion shows during our our class time and I make sure they're short so that they don't cut into the time of the class. So we arrange with some of our local shops to come in and give a fashion show. show so as not to show partiality, I like to give a list of all of the local square dance shops in the area, their addresses and phone numbers so that our beginners can get acquainted with these people. They'll be doing business with them and and we hope a lot of business for a long time. So I, I try to make this available to them. In addition, I make available the names and addresses of some catalog stores they can write and send off to for some square dance fashions. After we have had our little ready-made fashion show, the next part of the classes, I go into a short sewing demonstration, which generally takes two nights. And what I do here is I ask our angels that are coming out to help with the classes, I ask them to wear a certain type of dress, a circle skirt, a gourd skirt, a puff sleeve, a bell sleeve, whatever. I ask them to wear these, this type of a dress so that I can demonstrate and show the dress. I bring paper patterns that I've cut out at home for the dancers, for those who sew. I bring these to the classes and I show them how to cut them out. 
I unfortunately right now I have got about six square dance dresses cut out from the last two classes that we've had. They're not put together yet. They probably be a long time before they get there. But I try to to get the material and take it and show them how it goes. Square dance fashions are very different from what the average man on the street might might think and they will wind up making some very bad mistakes like the dresses won't be full enough or the sleeves will be too tight and you can you can stop a lot of this before it gets out of hand okay so we have our little sewing demonstration which as I said I generally break it up into two nights because I don't want to take up too much class time so we we have that we give out all the pamphlets we give out the information for them for any of the dancers who do not sew try and find two or three seamstresses in your area who are familiar with making square dance clothes have this name and phone number available to the dancers who do not sew make sure that your name is available to them if they have any questions about your patterns make sure that they know where they can go to buy the best fabrics the best buys, the closest fabric shops to where your club is located or to where the people might be located. But be sure that you give this information to them. Now, as I said, if you are not comfortable at giving the demonstrations, there are ladies in the club who will help you with it. But you go out and do the organizing of this part of your class because these are very special people that we're bringing into the activity. These are people who are tomorrow's dancers, and if we can train them right today, we can help them avoid a lot of the mistakes that we made along the way. So take an active part in your beginner's classes. You're the one they look up to. You're the instructor's partner, and you're very important to them. So take the, just a little extra time and give a little extra to your class, and the benefits are enormous. And thank you. Thank you, Carol. I'm sure you must have some questions for Carol that she would be more than happy to answer. Questions? Oh, good. Here comes one. Oh, yes, please. All right. Uh, Carol and I are good friends, and we've had many, many discussions. I would like to tell the ladies, they are all uh, possessive of many talents, which perhaps they haven't realized. First of all, if they're a lady or if it's a gentleman, they're a mother and a father. They have, they have these talents in raising their children. When you go to a square dance class, you're simply helping to raise your children uh, in, in the adult phase. Mm -hmm. So I would certainly uh, ask them all to take a good look at themselves and, and quit running themselves down. I think too many of us, as Carol said, when we were sort of pushed into this because our husbands picked up their minds and became a caller, we thought, oh, heavens, we won't get to dance anymore. How are we going to make this transition? I can never do it. I'm scared to death. But everything that you do in everyday life is applicable to work in your square dance caller's life uh, position and use it to the best of the ability. And I might say, if you go home and you say, oh, gee, there, we don't get leadership training in our area. Gals, let me tell you, in every county, with almost, without exception almost, there is a county extension office, which is uh, given material by your land grant colleges. These are marvelous places to go for this kind of uh, information if you're not getting it through your callers association. So remember your county extension office. They have lots of help for you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ruthie. That is good information to have, too, about the extension services. One thing, just before this, this question here, I would like to encourage some of you ladies, if you've, if you've had a problem or you've known of a caller's partner who's had a problem adjusting over into this limelight that we're thrown into, if you'd share your experiences with us, I might... I, I know I would enjoy hearing them and maybe some suggestions from you as to how some of these problems can be overcome. Go ahead. Lois Cotman. Hi, Lois. This is not a, um, a question. It's just something that I thought I'd like to share with all of you. Because I really feel so strongly about a caller and his wife being a team. I think that the one thing that's so important to remember is there is only one objective person at any square end, and that is the caller's partner. Everybody else, in most cases, is concerned about himself and his own abilities and how well he is doing. But as a caller's partner, you want that dance to be a tremendous success, and you want your partner to be terrific. You really are objective, not if it's too easy, too hard, but whatever it is, you really are the eyes and ears of your husband or partner, whatever it is. And when you, he is up there very often, calm, he's not always as aware of what's going on on that floor as you are. The little comments that are made, the look on somebody's face, and it's painful. And we've all gone through that feeling when suddenly you see someone with a long foot and you think you're so quiet if you have a long foot and you want to kill him. Whatever it is, we've all gone through it and we know what it's like. But the truth is that we are objective, and it really is important for us to be there. I truly believe that, because you can grab your husband on the side after that first hit and say, why did you do that? And listen to this. They all get mad at us, and we tell them they did something wrong. There's not one caller who can accept criticism gracefully. Right? Right? You want to say something back to you, it's not under But really, the only one who cares is us. We really care because we want them to be good. We don't care how well we dance. I don't have a test. When I'm at a square dance, it doesn't matter if I'm a great dancer or I'm not a great dancer. But mine is this, that that guy up there is terrific. I know it with, um, for example, there's another thing. I know that excitement and happiness and pleasure is contagious. And long persons are also contagious. And if you're going to sit around at a square with that long foot, for whatever reason it may be, it is contagious. And let me tell you, sometimes when we go to a dance, I'm giving you all my secrets, sometimes when we're at a dance, I always like to dance. I really hate it when I'm, well, not always, because that's a lie. There are some nights when I can't move, and it's not so easy to get up to dance. But in most cases, I do, and when I am dancing, I have to be turned on the whole time, because otherwise my husband will say to me afterwards, how come you were dragging your feet when you were dancing? What was wrong? I'm not allowed to be like that. I have to, and you know what else? When I'm in a square, the other people are going to have a good time if I'm having a good time. And while I'm dancing, I have the best, I really get, you know, if you convince yourself that you're having a good time. It works. It really does work. It's not baloney. And I can get myself really excited. And you know what else? Everybody else gets excited with you. That is the truth. It's, you just need one person to start it because square dancing is show business. It really is. And it's this show business thing. And you're turned on, and you're happy, and you're having a good time. It is contagious to everybody who's at that dance. And the long push really is also contagious. Thank you, Lilith. Okay. Anything else? Oh, good. Here comes another one. And the lady in the red right after her, please. A lot of, of times we do have to take back seats, and um, that's just part of the game. And the new caller's wife, I've known a few of them, that have a hard time 
a statement in adoration that an intention that their husband gets from being sin and saved. Um, we need a means of dealing with that, of helping the new new uh, new college wife deal with that. That's a that's a good comment. Uh, there really is a problem when you uh, when you're a new caller's wife. There is a problem when you go to those dances and you're not dancing anymore. Hey, I went through these lessons and I learned how to dance, and and we're out dancing, having a good time, and the next thing I know, I'm sitting here and he's up there calling, and I'm not dancing anymore. So all my time is wasted. Well. I think that this is when you just have to sit back and take stock of yourself and say, hey, I'm not going to be cut out of this activity. I'm going to do something about it. And I'm going to make a place for myself in the activity. Find out what your, your favorite part about square dancing is, if it's sewing, if it's uh, refreshments, if it's decorations, if it's being artistic. Find out what your very favorite thing that you like to do the most and head in that direction. There's so many areas to contribute in square dancing. There's so many things that, that are there to be done. And, it, and you know yourself, if you'll say yes, you'll never have a dull moment. They'll be after you all the time to do something. So be sure to be active and stay active so that you have a place in the activity for yourself. His place is up there on that stage calling. His place is teaching those dancers, teaching those new callers. You make a place for you, and there's lots of room out there. There's lots of room and lots of areas that you can contribute in. In the red, please. But I feel that a warning ought to be brought forth. Some years ago, when we were working our first festival, and we were local callers having traveled 400 miles. The other person that we were sharing the program was was a national name caller, who came in and his wife, and he spent the entire evening promoting themselves in such a manner as that at 10 o'clock they handed the committee handed Tom the check, and he said that you pay him. We are leaving because we are not going to hire them. They've done nothing but bug us all evening. So in your pre your your um, presenting yourself during the evening, be very cautious about the manner in which you promote yourself. Because it can if you overdo it, you can ruin it for yourself in an area. And this is exactly what this couple did. They had been popular in New England. They have not been in New England in 10 years. And I think it was that damn specific because the word passed out fast. Very good. I think this comes under the heading of judgment, which our, our convention is trying to uh, make some sense out of this year. And a very good point. As I say, I think this is, is under judgment. It's You have to acquire good judgment and know where to cut these things off and how far you can and can't go. Yes. Someone over here? I'm Mandy Broadway, Charlotte, North Carolina. I assume that we are saying by the remarks that we have heard today that the caller accepts these positions that we've been talking about. I think that's yeah. a point that we need to think about. Also, I would venture to say that most of the people in this room probably know more about what to do in their case than maybe the caller knows what to do with us. And I think that's another point to be considered. And maybe call that to consider having a session for callers and their relationship to their clients. Very good. Which leads to a good time for me to uh, 
to make a point that I thought of. I was in the education uh, meeting this morning for a short time and was very happy to see that uh, in their training program that they are working on now will be included uh, a training program of some kind for callers partners which I think is a very good start. On the other side of this we will suggest that they also have some include something in this on callers attitude toward their partners. I, th I think that's a very good suggestion. It's almost coffee break time. Uh, if you could stay a while after we need some input from you on what you would like to see in an education program that could be helpful to callers partners or to callers but we could use input from all of you and I'm sure you all have some very good ideas uh, we can be here until five o'clock and we would like very much to have you all come back after you have your coffee think about it while you're drinking your coffee and discussing and come back with some ideas we can take back to the committee. Thank you. Don't forget the handouts.